Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to Psalm. Chapter 133. My mind is racing today. Don't know why. And I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm burdened. Um, I'm not going to share why. I just am. I get, oh, I guess I'm like everybody else. I get weary sometimes. Uh, sometimes I get down. Uh, sometimes I get irritable. And I don't like being that way. It, it's irritating to be irritable as far as I'm concerned. And um, I don't know, some, I guess the devil's just after me. And um, he kind of plays with my emotions. He knows what buttons to push on me. And sometimes he does it worse than he does at other times. Or maybe God's grace is different, I don't know. But I get down and I get burdened. And it's usually ministry related. Usually is. And um, those, if you've never been in any kind of ministry, I'm not exalting the position above anybody else. I certainly wouldn't do that. Uh, but to be responsible for one person's soul is hard enough. And I don't... I'm not going to say I never prayed for a big church, but I know usually the bigger the size of the church, the more the responsibility, and some things I'm just not good at. I'm not, I don't have the gifts that other pastors have. I'm not a good administrator. I'm not a good executor. Um, some things beneficial to a ministry I just don't thrive at very well. Uh, but one thing I do, and that is God has blessed me by believing the words that I read in this book. I believe them. I feel strongly about them. And I try to do what I can to give out as much of that as possible each and every week. And um, sometimes the frustration comes when you feel like people aren't listening. And it, it bothers me. It bothers me quite a bit. So pray for me. And uh, if you think to pray for your pastor every now and then, please pray for your pastor every now and then. If God lays me on your heart for a reason, for some reason, stop and pray for me. I might be fighting one of your battles at the time. Or I might be fighting one of my own and not doing very well. So pray for your pastor, okay? This is what God's given us about brotherhood. I'm going to continue that this morning. We learned the first sermon that God has made us all in the same family. He's blessed us all, joined us together by the bond of God's Word, by the Holy Spirit, by the fact that we've all chosen Jesus instead of Buddha, Mohammed, or anybody else to be our Savior. We chose Jesus to be our Savior. Amen. And I believe that there are people all over the world who are not exactly like us that are still going to heaven. And that's the important thing. And it's something I, I am going to address this morning. It's something that God helped me see as a young, young man while I was in Bible college. When I left here at the age of 18 to go to college, I was pretty intolerant of a lot of people. I'm not so sure that I'm altogether different now, especially as I get older. The older you get, the more set in your ways. Amen? When you're young, you can bend better. 
When you're old, you don't. You're stiff. But I left here pretty intolerant. God put me in an environment where I didn't thrive very well. And God humbled me in many ways. And he taught me some things that I needed to know as a young man. Hopefully I've tried to carry some of those around to this day. And I'll get to that in a, in a moment. But it deals with what we're reading in Psalm 133. Verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He said, it is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. He said, think of it as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And if you, in case you're wondering what all that has to do with unity, apparently... When they anointed Aaron's head with oil to be the high priest, apparently it, they poured enough on him to run all down his face. Is, I wouldn't like that. I don't like anything on my face, on my lips, up my nose, nothing. Ran down his face, down his clothing. In other words, it covered all of him. Not just... See, when we anointed people in this church in the past with oil, put a little oil on my hands, I used to put it on my thumb and, or finger and whatever. But I went to a church in upstate New York, the pastor, uh, in fact, it was Noel Marino. He came there to hear me preach and he wanted to be anointed by the pastor. The pastor said, well, we've got to go outside. And I'm going, why is that? Because I thought maybe it had something to do, well, he's not a member of the church, so we don't anoint anybody that's not a member of our church. In the church, we do it out in the parking lot. And I'm going, I don't know if I agree with that or not. Then I found out why. That pastor, he poured oil all over him. I mean, it ran everywhere. He said, we don't want to get it on the carpet. That's why we do it in the parking lot. Oh, okay. Then when you look at verse 3, as the dew of Hermon, when the dew comes down from heaven, does it only touch the good grass, the good leaves, the good trees? When the dew comes down, it falls on everybody. Which one of us in this building this morning do you think God likes the most? I didn't say loves the most. Likes the most. I don't think he likes any of us any more than he likes anybody else. And we know from the Bible that when it rains, it doesn't just rain on the righteous. It rains on the unjust as well and the unrighteous. In that sense, does not God bless everybody? Everybody. Not just the people that we want Him to or the people that we like, or the people we agree with. He blesses everybody the same way. There's only one Savior for the whole world, is there not? And that Savior is good enough for everybody to receive and believe in, not just a certain people. Why do you think he had it planned to leave the Jews and go to the Gentiles? Number one, there's a lot more of us. Number two, God is sending signal. I really am no respect of persons. Good luck finding a judge in this world who's the same way. Because all of us have got a little judgmentalism built into us do we not do we not favor certain people over certain other people as we go about our daily affairs and we can base that on anything that we want it's still judgmentalism and it's built into our flesh and it takes a lot of grace to overcome all of that so now does that make sense to you 
Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Because when God anoints, He's going to anoint everybody. When He saves the body, He's going to save the whole body and not leave anybody out of it. Amen. When He said He died for the whole world, He meant the whole world and not leaving anybody out of that grace. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I ask for your help, your mercy, and your grace. And Father, I am nobody. And Lord, you've left just enough defects, peculiarities, sins, emotions in me to help me to remember that. That I am nobody. You didn't pick me because I'm more special than somebody else. You didn't give me something and not give somebody else because you like me more than you like somebody else. Father, you did it because of the love that you have for all mankind. The fact that Jesus died for everybody tells me that. And that he intended to leave nobody out. And Father, the worst of us is going to receive the grace that we need to have everlasting life. Just like the best of us are going to receive that grace as well. Maybe some people need more than others. Maybe some people just don't have what other people have. But God, you don't see it that way. When you say that the church is the body, you don't intend to leave anybody out of it. Father, remind us of that today. Father, help me preach or help me teach or cause me to get out of the way so you can. And Father, there are people, people here, people at home who are struggling today. They're not doing very well. And Lord, I'm with them. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would bless all of those who are not doing so hot today. Help them and do for them what they can't do for themselves. And remind us, God, that you did it. Help us to heed your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I heard a sermon when I was in Bible college. I, it's one that I remembered. I heard a lot of sermons, a lot of preaching when I was a young man in college. There was one that I remembered. And I'll never forget what the man said. And he was preaching at the National Association of Free Will Baptists. And I was there at that meeting in Nashville, Tennessee, 1985 was what year that was. It was after my first year in Bible college. And he was preaching to an entire denomination. And I did not know at that time that the denomination as a whole was fractured up the way it is. But as I got to meet different men in the denomination those years ago, I realized that they, God didn't make them all the same. And I would probably side more with some people even now than I would with others even now. I wouldn't agree with some of the things that they believe, some of the things they did, some of the things they practiced. Some of the things that they tried and succeeded or tried and failed, I, I probably have my opinions as we all do. We have great opinions about everybody that we have and about how they do things versus how we do things. And we're pretty good at looking at somebody's life and saying, well, they're doing it wrong. They're doing life wrong. They're doing this wrong. They don't do this right. Try this food. This food is better than the food you're eating. Try it my way. My way is actually superior to your way of doing things. All of us have that in us. Do we not? And it's hard when they are in your own family. 
which is who we are. Family members. You can pick friends in this world or people to love based upon how similar they are to you and to what you like. But you were born with your siblings. You can't control them. You can't think for them. You can't tell them what to do. You tried that when y'all were eight. They didn't like it then and they don't like it now. Amen. But look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now I beseech you, brethren, verse 10, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you. Now, all, all of us speaking the same thing, pretty easy. We just open up the same. If we all use the same Bible, we'll all speak the same thing. Amen? And that's where you get into a problem. If you're going to have 15 different Bibles in your church, they don't all say the same thing. They don't. There are significant differences among them. And so we've, we've got that part down somewhat. But there are divisions among us. And there always will be. I used to, in, in my youth, in my, when I was a young man at Bible college and had all these... I, I viewed those years, J.R. And I'll just tell you, I hated my 20s. I never bring up my 20s in a conversation ever. Because my mind was full of untested ideals. Y'all remember those days? Jim, you remember those days? You were 19 and everybody had it all wrong. And I was part of that youthful zeal about why do we need denominations to begin with? There's no denominations in the Bible. Well, actually there are. You've got to know how to look for them. But as I grew older, I realized that it was God's way of keeping us from killing one another. Because you, you see it this way and I see it this way. And if we're two parts of a magnet and if you get them too close, that ain't good. They will repel one another. And um, so there's, there's people who have an internet ministry like I do that some people like more than they like me. So that's fine. I may not agree with everything some of those guys say, but God's called them and God's using them. And I've mentioned this before when it comes to my own friends in the ministry. I don't have very many. And generally it's because of this Bible. And um, the ones that I do have, I keep. Which means that if I've got a friend in the ministry... Us ministers, we're pretty hard-headed about stuff. I'm just being honest. Bull-headed and stubborn when it comes to what we believe about the Bible. And I've learned year, from years, years of experience, if I've got a man in the ministry that is my friend, I don't go after him on what he disagrees with me on. I don't feel like chasing him down to make him come around to my way of thinking. Now, I've had men that have called me on the phone, asked me questions, or they've come here and asked me questions. I'll give them, if they ask me, I'll tell them. But I've learned that we're not always going to see eye to eye on everything in the Bible. And I, there are some things just not worth losing friendship over. Because I don't have very many. You need to understand that even in, the, even in this church... I can't be too close to any one person here. It's not healthy. I can't divulge too many things about myself to people here because this wouldn't be a good idea. So there's not very many people that I can open up to and talk to. So with these guys, I just leave them alone on what... I know I don't agree with them on. I've never chewed them out, never chased them down, never went after them. Because love is just more important than that. 
Now, these guys that I have as friends, we all believe the same Bible, and we believe in the same Jesus, the same blood, and the same ideas about most, of, most everything, but not everything. So when Paul said that there be no divisions among you, did he actually mean that we all have to agree as to touching every point of doctrine and every concept and philosophy in the Bible? That's not possible. And since he mentioned the body, but that should be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment, it's like asking this finger to join with this finger. If they do that, that will lock me up. So that the rest of my hands won't be able to do what they were used to doing. Does that make sense? Okay? So he does make members of my body differently than he does others because they serve a different use and purpose than the others. Does that make sense? Even people in this church, I don't demand, number one, that you have to be physical Handwritten, signed members of our church. Number two, I don't demand that you agree with everything I say and be simply yes men or yes women in the church. I don't go for that. I don't come after you and demand that you see everything my way. I've learned from pastors in the past. What happens when you try that? People are going to buck against it and they're going to walk. So I've learned that's not something that's Number one, even possible. Number two, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. Because after all, I haven't learned it all yet. If I haven't learned it all, that means there are still some people out there that I need to learn it from. And if I remain willing to learn some things from some people, then I'm still growing. Does that make sense? He said... In uh, verse 11, For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now, he didn't say the word divisions. He said the word contentions. You know what a contention is? It's a division where somebody picked a fight. It is a division where somebody started an argument about it and said, you need to hear my way you need to hear what I have to say about it. And then, if you don't come around to it, well, obviously you're stupid and I'm not. And it's hard, it's hard for a church member to think their pastor is an idiot and sit there in the pew. Mike Hutzel took a church years ago and he had a man come to him and just told him outright, Mike, I love you, I love you preaching. But he said, I've been a member of this church for years, I'm going to have to leave. Why? He said, I can't sit under you. Why not? You didn't, go, you didn't graduate Bible college. And he said, I just can't listen to anybody that is ignorant and unlearned. And I know Mike Hutzel well enough that he probably said, well, good luck finding that other church then. A contention is a division where someone picked a fight over it. Unnecessarily. Now, what somebody else in this church does... How does that affect you? What if somebody in this church gives more money than somebody else? Does, does that affect you? Does that... Well, I won't ask you if it bothers you, because it might. But what one person gives in this church, does that affect you? I'm just pulling stuff out of the air. No. What one person does in their house away from you, does that affect you? Does that hurt you or harm you in any way, shape, or form? Then why does it matter? And I am. I'm just picking stuff out. I'm picking stuff out that I've seen before out of church people. And I'm telling you, Christians are notorious at fighting one another. We've been doing it. Once we get done fighting the lions, we go after each other. And Paul said there's contentions there. And a contention is just somebody that picked a fight over it. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos. And I of Cephas, which is Peter. And I of Christ. See, there's always that one group that says, well, we're better than everybody else. We're of Christ. And he said, is Christ divided? 
Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I can't get even my wife to agree with me on everything. And I think I've learned enough wisdom in this world to learn that I can't get everybody to agree with me on everything. But some things are important to me and I want you to know that. When I see, and this is part of what's got me down this week, when I see people being deceived on the internet, it bothers me. Part of it is the nature of the ministry. I'm a caretaker for people's souls. That responsibility is given part of it into my hand. I, I am a gatekeeper, a watchtower, and a shepherd. And in the days before the internet, we didn't worry about this too much. But now in social media, the false doctrines, they all have a significant voice. And I don't mind telling you, I'll do my best in a video to, to put out the best information that I can, and I see they'll get 3,000 views. And I see some idiot, some goof idiot. Do you know the earth is flat and everybody's lying to you? 100 million views. And I'm going, I don't get it. And it bothers me. When I see my people being lied to, and I know they're lying. And this week I'm going to try to help out if God will let me put it together. I started working on it the other day. It's called the rules of evidence. How you should believe what you believe. Don't just believe stuff because it's something you agree with. Don't just believe it. Court, there's things that have happened in this country that have had no effect on us. Like things between races. Like a black guy got killed by a white guy. And I noticed that all the black people said the black guy didn't do anything wrong. And then I noticed all the white people saying the white guy had a reason to kill him. But we weren't there. None of us saw it. None of us were sitting on the jury. So why is it that we have to have such strong opinions about an issue that we didn't have anything to do with? My great-great-grandparents probably owned slaves. Matthew dug up family history that I didn't know nothing about. And I know for a fact one of my ancestors owned slaves when he moved to Arkansas. But that wasn't me. Amen? So we pick things and we set up issues of what we don't like about somebody else. And we make a decision to judge somebody's intelligence or judge their relationship with Jesus based upon that, we use that as leverage against one another. And I'm telling you, it will tear a church apart. And I'm telling you, we don't need help with that one. Because we got a devil wanting to do it every week. Simply because of her. Is this woman worth fighting over the flat earth for? Is she worth some of the petty arguments or the petty disputes that we dream up against one another? Her life hangs on whether or not this church keeps doing what God has us doing. Turn to Acts chapter 15. Let me give you a little wisdom that I learned. Acts, and I want you to turn to the chapter, not just look at the verses that I have up on the screen. Because I want to talk about this for a minute. Acts chapter 15, up until from like Acts chapter 1 to 15, as the Holy Ghost is poured out, even before the Holy Ghost was poured out, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 that they were all in the upper room. They were all with one accord. They were there praying. The Holy Ghost fell upon them all. And God made it certain that not all of the men who were preaching on that day were preaching the same language. They were all preaching different languages. Amen? 
One to one group, another to another group. And God picked that. Those men didn't pick that. God picked that. And we see that up until Acts chapter 15, the churches and the believers had all things common. They had a common faith, common salvation. They had even their property. They divided up to benefit others so that everybody had plenty. But now the first real test of Christian unity has come up. And it is a serious issue. It is an issue serious enough that Paul had to deal with the Galatian churches over it. And at least one epistle he dealt with it exclusively. And that is, are we saved by the works of the law? Now, if, if you want to be in with me on an issue... You're going to be in with me on salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and that not of ourselves. And if you start thinking salvation is of any works, I don't have much in common with you. In fact, I just don't like people who believe in work salvation. I just don't like them. And that's a thing with me because it puts people in bondage. And I hate that. And it makes some people over other people in the church. How would you like it if I stood and looked at this church and I said, now I can tell, you can tell by looking at the people in this church, who's really close to God and who isn't. I mean, after all, we have front pews and back pews. And I know of a preacher who did this. The back pew people, are, and those are the ones that come on Sunday morning. They don't come any other time. And you can just tell, they ain't as close to God as the people who are around the pastor all the time and up toward the front. And I mean, he made a big deal about this. I don't like guys like that. I don't like people like that. So in Acts chapter 15, there was an, a serious issue. This is not over the earth is flat, or this is not did we go to the moon. This is not who shot J.R. or who shot John Kennedy. This wasn't anything like that. This was a serious issue. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, if I would have heard that, I would have probably made a video about them and said, they're all, they're all apostates, every one of them. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined... Now, look at, what, look at your Bible. Look at what they did. They got into it. It was a serious issue. No small dis dissension means it was big. Disputation with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. Being brought in their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Now, you go through this chapter. They, at this meeting was the apostles, the elders of the various congregations, the brethren, and all of them, there was no pope, there was no boss, there was nobody who said, this will be, I will settle this, no judge. They all came together because it was a serious enough issue that they felt like they needed it. And it wasn't just one person who had a voice in that meeting. Many people stood up and spoke. And they voiced what? Opinions. Opinions. Those can be pretty... Is it 1230 already? Those can be pretty dangerous. Opinions. Especially... If we're wrong about somebody. I didn't realize it was so late. But they finally settled the issue. Because the Holy Ghost and our Savior loved those men. He decided to help them all. He helped them with Scripture. James is the one. Who actually stood up and said, men and brethren, this is what we ought to do. He was no boss. He was not the first chief apostle. He was not the pope. He was just one among them 
that God wanted him to say these things. And when he said them, you know what happened? The Holy Ghost all of a sudden burst the bubble of everybody in that room. Broke through the wall of what they had chosen to, be, to believe. And all of them agreed on the same thing. Everybody in there agreed. Now, how often does that happen? How often does that happen in a family about supper time? Doesn't happen very often. But it can. And I'll tell you what the guy said in the sermon that I remembered back in 1985. Three words. Unity without uniformity. Let Sister Betty Walsh live. She nodded her head. That's why I got you on my mind. Let her live the way she wants to live. She's an elder woman in this church. She don't want to live your way. She don't want to eat your food every day. She don't want to wear the same clothes you wear every day. She's been used to living on her own now for quite some time. And she don't want you messing with it. I'd say the same thing about my mother. She don't want you messing with her lifestyle. So, years ago, God beat into me this thing. Mike, it's not my, not my place to live everybody's life for them. And to tell everybody what they should and should not be doing in every part and every aspect of their life. It's not my place. It is, however, God's place. And I'm content with letting God do what God wants to do in your life. You know, I could probably go to somebody in this church seeing that they're making a mistake in their life and I could probably intervene and step in and say, well, I see you're making a big mistake here. Why don't I give you what I think you ought to be doing and you do that? which I used to be that way. And then I've figured out that, number one, not everybody wants my advice. Number two, if I could talk somebody into doing something, couldn't somebody talk them out of it? So who's keeping them from making a mistake? Is it God or is it me? It would be me. But you know what God lets me do often? JR, this is what I was telling you a while ago. God lets me make big mistakes every now and then. Dangerous ones. Ones that keep me in the hospital. Or ones that hurt. Or ones that hurt people around me that I care about. God lets me make those mistakes knowing that he told me not to do it anyway, and he lets me make those mistakes, so then I learn the hard way not to ever do that again. If you go in the military, or if you go into law enforcement, we need you locally. If you go into law enforcement, they're going to train you. It's going to be the eight worst weeks of your life. Guarantee you. Amen. Anybody's in the army? Eight worst weeks of your life. And what's going to happen is they're going to put a rifle in your hand and they're going to watch you make mistakes with it in a secure area where nobody can get hurt. Then they will train you to not make those mistakes. And isn't that how it works? So I'm going to close. Next time you decide that your way is better for somebody's life, consider, number one, that nobody asked you. If they do, however, say something. Say something to somebody. If they ask you, if they ask you your opinion, give it. 
Now, sometimes people ask me my opinion and I give it and I usually feel bad after I said it because I didn't say what they wanted me to say. But they asked. But it's better to let God deal with it in somebody else's life. Let God have it. That way we can still love one another. I may see you and I know you're making a mistake. God knows you're making a mistake. When you make it, I guarantee you, you either be better for it. Let's pray. God run out, God run out of things to say. Father, I love you. I thank you, Lord, for your word, and I thank you, Father, for your kindness. I thank you for these people. I wouldn't trade any of them in. For a million dollars, I wouldn't do it. And the people of Kenya, we've been offered that million dollars, and we wouldn't take it. We're not going to turn them over to the wolves. So, Father, I thank you for everything you've blessed me with. And I thank you for these people. They mean more to me than I mean to myself. And I pray, Lord, that you would always help us to love one another as family. To try our best to get along with one another as best as we can. And to leave other folks alone and let you deal with them. Let you change them. Let you fix them. Instead of us trying to do it. And help us to love one another with that pure love that you love us with. Don't make us like one another. Don't make us uniform to one another. But make us love one another. That's what we ask. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. If you stand, you are dismissed.